Another brand of BJP politics which works in the south could have been a more stronger way. They call it the Dattatreya model and Naidu, you know, he can't afford to sit in the opposition one more term. If Mr. Jagan Mohan Reddy has decided that it is the welfare agenda that's going to win him the votes and that's where he's investing, I know he ensures that the promises that have been made are, uh, gets fulfilled. That's what his his, his agenda is. Nara Lokesh only after this Padyatra seems to be coming, uh, you know, becoming a politician on his own. I'm talking to some man on the street, a cobbler actually. I asked him this and he said, "Ki uh, national security ke liye karna padta, madam. Ye haan ke nahi. Uh, we don't, uh, you know." We, uh, अपने डिफेंस के लिए करना पड़ता है नेशनल इलेक्शन में अलग होता है सो इट्स एन एब्सोल्यूट प्लेजर एंड ऑनर फॉर साउथ ऑन न्यूज टू वेलकम सीनियर जर्नलिस्ट मिसेस उमा सुधीर मिसेस उमा सुधीर हैपेंस टू बी द एग्जीक्यूटिव एडिटर फॉर एनडीटीवी न्यूज़ टू बिगिन विद मैम वी हैव हर्ड दैट यू हैव लिव्ड अ फेयर शेयर ऑफ योर लाइफ इन हैदराबाद बॉम्बे दिल्ली अम as having this regional diversity how do you balance it out i'm like do you have any preferred states or cities in your life okay first of all thank you so much for having me and i'm i think it's absolutely wonderful that you've started something that wants to give a south focus and address in fact audiences uh, in the rest of the country if you may put it that way um uh, having lived everywhere i think it gives you more perspective about what it means uh, to be a south indian or to be a north indian when i grew up in delhi at that time it was this madrasi who was anyone south of the vindhyas was madrasi uh, similarly in the south as well anyone north of the vindhyas is a punjabi i mean they 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 think yes. if you are not uh, sardar ji or you know if you are not a punjabi then you are not north indian so that continues but i think the diversity of being in different parts of the country gives you the uh, ability to appreciate the cuisine the culture the music the films of course now they are universal everywhere i guess uh, so that's a big advantage i find and uh, being from any part of the country you know i start taking ownership for it i say acha bombay okay i've been there oh. then i uh, you know if anyone says madurai i'll say yeah yeah madurai meenakshi is my uh, you know father's uh, goddess i mean the, uh, the city from where uh, he hailed so delhi yes i'll say my god karolbag south x all that i mean so I think it's a joy to be able to enjoy all that and that I think does add to my life as a journalist as well because you have seen different parts of the country working life student life and uh, a professional life I guess I've been mean, traveling everywhere sure I've heard that you said about cuisines and all that sounds that you're a foodie so do you have do you consider yourself a foodie or like do you have your picks from the different cities and states I'm a vegetarian but I love to uh, taste all sorts of food and I I love the idea of uh, traveling to different places and trying the food there and wherever I go I uh, uh, you know I recently went to a wedding where which was quite an exotic wedding and they had blue rice and uh, cuisine from elsewhere my husband said ultimately I'm going to eat rasam chadam <laughs> rasam chadam is like you know what is a very very basic south yes. indian thing but uh, I like the idea of trying something else but the fact that I'm vegetarian perhaps is limiting but I find the variety uh, a tremendous so I enjoy what I eat and uh, that's life I think part of the joys of life is being able to eat different kinds of cuisine and the kind of variety in our we have in our own country is so yes. wide and so well, vast it's fantastic yes that's great telling back to your experiences ma'am how has the political landscape changed from what you've experienced in your college back when you were young and now that you have your own share of professional experiences how do you think that this political landscape has is there any transformation or do you see any shift in that okay i went to college in uh, delhi hindu college and that was the time when the mandal agitation was going on so at that time we did not even know what was going on but we would all be going and sitting there you know uh, on the campus i was in hindu college and we would go to a, a place which was called morris nagar and everyone would be out on the roads and just the excitement of when you are a student also people say sometimes you know that politics should be very away from students i think students should participate in politics and it doesn't mean that you politicize politicize institutions they are two different things i find many youngsters saying that no no we are not interested in politics you know that's a dirty place to be in it's a cesspool no i think people need to be very involved with politics aware of what is happening i don't remember being so very aware but i was very interested in what was happening and therefore we went and participated and some very unfortunate incidents also happened at that time uh Uh, which became actually banner uh, headlines on certain uh, or in all the newspapers there 
uh, immolation of a student that started off all this caste based politics and so on and so forth. But what I think is the biggest thing that has changed from then to now is actually technology. And that's why every every uh, every sphere is untouched by it and politics included. At that time, if you had physical campaigns, now we see that everything that happens happens on social media and it happens in a virtual manner. And I think there's a uh, there are many many uh, four five very important trends that have happened. I mean, for that time we spoke about you know in the 90s we spoke about globalization as the big thing, you know? and we said oh English speaking you know we have to be more and more English speaking to be able to find our place in the world and so on. But now the world has changed. You are actually talking hyper local, yes. and it's hyper local that's working, that's earning you the money. People are interested in what's happening in the neighborhood, and yes. all that is enabled by what? By technology. Yeah. Similarly, in politics as well, I think the rules of the game have changed. The way yes. in which you operate it has changed. Media has changed tremendously yes. from when I started to now, yes. and uh, therefore politics as well. But what remains? Uh, even and even now the same is that we are still a democratic country yes <laughs> we still are able to elect our leaders we need uh, we are able to our people uh, you know uh, whatever you may think about the literacy rates and so on but they are able to throw out who they think they don't want and they have shown the power of the uh, uh, of the vote very very effectively and i think that's something that's remained uh, good constant. and still constant and i think that's that's a celebration that i still go with I think from over the time people have started becoming more aware also thanks to journalism and thanks to media uh people are vocalizing their thoughts their opinions now that information is being reached every nook and corner so people are tremendously aware of what's going on like around them behind them so i think that is one of the reasons don't you think so see earlier information was very limited journalism was also kind of a little elitist because it was a one way communication i tell you and you listen that's what it was except for letters to the editor and some feedback that you could get now the rules of the game have changed you are as much a producer of information as you are a consumer of and it applies to all of us in all spheres of life we consume as much as we almost produce on a daily basis and i think that's kind of in a sense uh, universalize this power of the media and uh, it is also done another thing two or three different things that have happened ever since uh, say you know video platforms like youtube or internet have come what is that has also done is that you no longer have an elite you know only english speaking audience you now find that say uh, all the regional languages which people earlier thought you know they kind of scoffed at the idea that oh my god if you are a hindi medium or a telugu medium or a tamil medium is it something to look down upon because you never get opportunity in the right. world outside right. there but now you realize the biggest markets are not in english if yeah. i start today a youtube channel i won't get the kind of uh, uh, you know hits in yes. uh, in an english as i can do in a hindi yes. uh, hindi actually the maximum or in tamil or in telugu and so on so those languages have got rediscovered and i think that has added power to the uh, idea of democracy so it right. has democratized the media space the only um, rider should i say is that there's so much of information that you don't know where to get credible yeah. information and that idea of credibility of the media unfortunately yes. because uh, the place space is so crowded you don't know any longer what is credible and what is not credible and that confusion yeah overly being bombarded exploded with information that's a problem but i think it's all for a good thing yeah i think for that matter we have to pick and choose wisely of what we are interpreting now moving on to our next question journalism is said to be a man's world i mean like a male dominated profession how did that how did you end up being in this profession i'm like there must be some sort of motivation that you know had keep you going on and on and on so what was that okay so i graduated with science so i'm a science honor student from uh, hindu oh. college in fact and subsequently i uh, i thought i would do public administration because i thought i'll be in the civil services i wanted to be in the civil services but there was used to be those days there was actually no journalism a course in college so we used to have a times research foundation which was something that was run by the times of india group and uh, i joined them and i started working there because i thought it's better for me uh, to be up on my current affairs and so on so i thought i'll do journalism but once i went into it it was something very exciting very uh, um, should i say uh, every day something new would be happening and you are uh, with the world uh, all the time these developments you were you calling there 
Yes, you realize that you know this is something that I enjoy doing, understanding what's happening. You have this opportunity to do so many different kinds of things, and everywhere you are not the expert. You are asking the questions, but it's an opportunity to learn, and uh, it's an opportunity to also be exposed to so many different things. But you are saying no women in uh, uh, in journalism, uh, which is quite true. Even today, if you see the uh, uh, if in the leadership positions you were to see, there will be less than ten percent women in leadership. Whether it is the print media, whether it is television or digital media, it actually uh, will reduce as you go from uh, you know digital is the highest. Yeah. Then you have uh, print, and then uh, then you have television, and then you have the print media. And even in that, if you see uh, you know television, people think anchors are there and they'll want glamorous faces, and therefore there will be more women. Uh, there's something called uh, uh, you know in the panels we call them. Panel is becomes a panel because there are only men on the panel. Yeah. So. Uh, there is, in fact, a, uh, you know, BBC had tried this, saying that we want to ensure that 50% of our content, whether it is the source of information, whether it is the uh, uh, people who subjects of the information, or the uh, you know who you are talking to as a source or as an expert, all that should be women. So you had to actually very consciously introduce women into these. So i am going to give you an example of times of india where uh, i worked for a few years in delhi and uh, uh, quite quickly actually i became the youngest chief subeditor bringing out the delhi edition of the times of india oh, cool. when i was about 23 24 i was doing that and at that time we have had all women panels on that all women panels and all, all women desk i'm saying okay. at night bringing out the edition there would be all women but it's a fact that except maybe a few organizations like that ndtv was another exception i've worked with ndtv for 25 years now and because perhaps all of you know the name of dr pranoy roy i mean he appears on screen but there's radhika roy who is his wife who is the actual boss if there's a room like this it's radhika would be sitting here and pranoy would be sitting there and she'll be telling him no pranoy you can't do this you must do this and so on so because she came from she was a journalist initially in indian express and so on but because the leadership was women yeah. i think the organization per se it was not reservation it was because they were good workers they were excellent journalists they worked well it very naturally happened that there would be more women than men i used to have bosses who were all women at one point in time i mean i'm saying yeah. so there are organizations which do that but when i came to the uh, when i came to hyderabad i remember even in these political meetings or uh, in um, Uh, in even political conferences much more than that in the socials afterwards or okay. something like that you would be the only woman yeah. in the uh, room sometimes and they didn't know how to uh, you know even uh, be with you or Correct. talk to you there would be a little uh, awkward i remember going to one of those I, i shouldn't put it that way but one one political party in which there is uh, there was a gathering of completely of men and i was uh, sitting there alone and then after some time somebody came to me ियम इन you know andhra politics so there okay. will be uh, one region of uh, the state where there used to be a lot of violence political violence oh. people are divided not as political parties alone but as factions they call them okay. and there would be murders and there would be country bombs and so on and there was one uh, mp who had uh, gone missing because somebody uh, had been killed in delhi and then he went missing and i met him at a hotel here okay. and he was considered to be one of those uh, people who has murdered and so okay. on and so forth so uh, when i met him at the hotel he was more nervous than me i think he said madam um, we are not always like that you can have breakfast with me as well kind of a, you know he was almost apologetic for it so i'm saying it comes from such a place uh, uh, because you are a woman initially they may be reluctant to accept you but i think that acceptance is increasingly come now if you see in a hyderabad all the national media channels have reporters who are women many of them are yes, women yes. so which is a fantastic thing to happen i think yeah. but i do remember a very young girl in a uh, local uh, uh, media she was working for a telugu media i hate to call it uh, local over nakira uh, she was working for the telugu media and i remember her sharing something which is very uh, sad mm-hmm. uh, she uh, this was many years ago but uh, that struck me always because she said uh, somewhere where she had gone and she was with her colleagues and uh, uh, 
uh, the guy actually asked him, um, intercourse chestara. So, uh, means uh, it sounds like what it is. Okay. okay. Then he corrected it to be, she said she was shocked and she asked him what? Then he said, intermediate course chestunara and I know. Intermediate is class 11 and 12 here. So, uh, I think the situation is not even when I am saying, you know, I as a woman entering the field of journalism, having the privilege of working in organizations which were culturally different is different from women who are entering the media in organizations where that culture is not there and uh, uh, that kind of uh, uh, more comfort and acceptance of the woman uh, yeah. in, as a professional is not there. So I I thought that is one of the reasons I think why uh, women also, I mean I am part of what is called uh, South Asian women in media and we are yeah. women in all the SARC countries in fact and uh, all of us got together and felt that all our issues were so similar. Actually they are not just in South Asian countries, across the world across they are similar. The world. They are very similar and uh, one of the most um, beautiful moments I thought, we were uh, uh, actually in Lahore, uh, we had okay. gone to Pakistan and where the, the founding thing had happened and there were women, women from Afghanistan would come there and I remember that meeting like this, we were all sitting there and that woman from Afghanistan was breastfeeding a baby even as the meeting was going on and I thought that's such a, um, a liberating image Correct. of a woman uh, at work, she is uh, having a baby yes. along with her breastfeeding the baby at the business table should we call it I mean it's, it was a working meeting that we were having and I thought that is the image that we need to carry away and I asked her uh, permission because she was also from Afghanistan can I shoot you like this yeah. and took a picture of her like that and I thought it was a very telling image of where uh, people were going where they wanted to and it was a uh, Afghanistan at that time even more so was a dangerous place yes. for any journalist woman especially so definitely Talking about your journey ma'am, uh, we heard that you covered Naidu's rebellion back in 1995. How was that, I mean like what was your experience like that uh, back then and uh, if you could just share some tidbits from that. <laughs> okay, um, when I came to Hyderabad, uh, we thought we were coming into a state where uh, Mr. N.T. Ramana was the chief minister, he had been yes. a thespian actor. And uh, he was someone who, you know, started those Rath Yatras, yes. he would go around, he was a very colourful man, yes. he would be, uh, you know, taking bath in the, uh, on the road like that. Yes. I mean, uh, all that was very, very, uh, what a politician, I mean, he was a public performer and he, he was also a celebrated figure. He was a celebrated figure and more than that, I think he also knew the pulse of the people in yes. many ways. He was Definitely. able to uh, relate to many things. I would have thought somebody who spent so many years in cinema perhaps may not have the, um, wisdom to handle certain other things yeah. but I know that even in his handling of left-wing terrorism uh, you know youth who went uh, the next slide he has he has shown a lot of uh, you know forethought yeah. and a uh, lot of political sagacity oh. and uh, uh, when I came here it came suddenly it happened yes. suddenly the August coup had happened suddenly and we hardly there were no cell phones at that time right. for that and I didn't even have a landline phone because we just landed in the month of August here on okay. the 10th of August 1995 and soon afterwards this coup happened so uh, the image that is in my mind is what used to be called the Viceroy Hotel yes. and opposite that uh, you know Mr. Edi Ravara comes like that and he's such a revered figure people couldn't even face him the people who were in his party and yes. elected as in MLA's and there was a slipper that was uh, thrown at him and uh, politics is like that I think. So I remember from a man who was, uh, who became a you know, chief minister in the shortest period possible time. I mean he was an actor who launched a political party and became, made a success of it, huge success of it. And from there I remember subsequently going to his home in uh, Banjara Hills area and uh, when power goes away all the uh, trappings of power go away, there is no one there, there is silence there. So what journalism through so many decades has taught me is that people who are who have been very powerful and who have lost it, there have been people who have uh, been people who uh, served you tea at a press conference or gave you a uh, you know, paper and a pencil to write in press conference because those days we didn't have digital devices yes. in any case or pens and they have become uh, uh, very powerful politicians now. Yes. So. Uh, Things can happen either way. Uh, the wheel of life teaches you many lessons and you realize that what is today is not what is going to be tomorrow and therefore I think it's not just for your own sake but to treat everyone with respect, with the kindness that they deserve 
and uh, to treat everyone equal. So for me, I always tell my camera person, whether we are going to the richest man's house or we are going to a poor man's house, we always take their permission before getting in. We take their permission before, you know, uh, if, we, if we have to leave our footwear outside sure. and before shooting because there is also always a presumption that if it's a poor person, you can just go and shoot at his house. He may have had a grief, he may have had a bereavement, anything. And with a rich person, you're so much more careful because of you know their human rights and so on. But right. I think as journalists, we understand, we should understand that everyone needs to be treated with that kind of respect because life is such that it can go up, go down, all that will happen. But your professionalism should not go. Yeah, I think it's a vicious cycle that we have to keep going on and on. <laughs> But ma'am, about this uh, rebellion that happened back in 1995, do you think this fight helped uh, TDP to grow as a regional party? Do you think that any any manner it helped TDP? Telugu Desam as a party had already been established uh, with its very strong uh, board basis here. Uh, you know, political parties are based on many many factors. One could be the caste factor, one could be the kind of segments to which you appeal, yes. uh, so on and so forth. So, uh, like I said, Mr. N. T. Ramara, uh, his party had, uh, you know, if the Congress earlier, that's a part, that was the party in power, if it was dominated by a particular caste, ready caste, as we all can openly talk about mm -hmm. it or say, uh, mention it. The other uh, backward caste which uh, happened, backward classes which happened to be more than 50% of the population, they did not have any political representation. I think many of them found their political voice and political opportunity in a Telugu Desu. But what Mr. Naidu did was, uh, uh, while you know one segment may have picturized him as the villain in that particular case, he yes. saw political opportunity and he uh, he, yeah, he he uh, he was there at the right time, and yeah. he had the political uh, thinking to be able to exploit an opportunity that came his way. Perhaps he has also had his share of political experience before that. But what you must see is also what he did with the party, and the kind of a profile that Mr. Chandrababu Naidu himself earned. He he uh, reinvented his image in the party. It is not. Yeah. He was not trying to become an NTR. He could never have become an NTR because the kind of charisma that uh, NTR had was very different. But Naidu reinvented himself yeah. in a different way. So I think um, at every stage, see, uh, in NDTV, we say uh, we were the original uh, television company. Yes. Out of NDTV came many of these stars yes. who are there yes. now in every other channel. Yes. And each of them evolved and created their own space, whether it's an Arnav Goswami, whether it's a Rajdeep Sardesai or anyone else. I mean, most of the people would have come out of the NTTV stable. But I'm yes. saying so, that's a natural progression that happens that people uh, go and set up. If if a Mantha Energy had not left her original party and set it up, it would not have been. Sharad Pawar, similarly so. So, yeah. whoever goes out and they form their own parties. I mean, in the uh, in Tamil Nadu, if you were to see the Dravidian parties, I mean, if AIA, DMK had not been carved out, DMK had not been carved out as separate parties. I'm saying they, are, they have their own identities and they uh, uh, they may have been similar in many manners, but yes. they were able to carve their own distinct kind of spaces. Yes. Uh, and therefore, the dominance of those two parties, where the national parties have never been able to. Similarly, here I think the Telugu Desam was able to carve a niche for itself, reinvented itself in many ways while working on its traditional strengths. It was able to. So yes, it did strengthen itself for you know for uh, till 2004. We saw Mr. Naidu as yes. chief minister. Yes. Then of course, uh, a new brand of uh, Politics also started with the kind of Padayatra that Mr. Yes. Uh, YSR did and yes. that Padayatra catapulted him to power. So he saw what the what could be the possible weakness in a Naidu model which was perhaps seen as more urban oriented and rejected to uh, cater to the rural audiences which are much more uh, bigger in yes. terms of a vote share and he was able to do it and subsequently you saw every uh, leader who is doing a Padayatra become successful yes. and say it was uh, YSR in 2003 and he came to power in 2004. Subsequently, you saw uh, Naidu doing it, then you saw Jagan Mohan Reddy doing it. Again, now we see Nara Lokesh doing yeah. it. Uh, even before 2019, we saw Naidu again doing it. So, uh, Padhyatras have now become that way of connecting directly with the people and using social media or other kinds of media to be able to multiply it multifold and uh, so politics has changed, isn't it? Yeah. So, yes, uh, yes, definitely. Yeah, so it has changed, but I'm saying 
everything comes with an invention and innovation and a new way of telling and connecting mm-hmm. with the people but don't you think this uh, ongoing trend of doing padyatra has now somehow become monotonous over the period of time or does it still serves any purpose because we see nara lokesh doing this uh, padyatra recently what is your take on that for everyone it's a way of connecting with the people yeah uh, so while you may look at it as a political Agenda. yatra uh, political um, strategy yes. yeah, but people need that connect with the people and i think they uh, i remember i met lokesh after he had finished his yatra or he was just about to finish his yatra and i thought he had become a more pol- mature politician Okay. Jagan Mohan Reddy, I know. I mean, uh, you know, from from the time of Mahatma Gandhi, who went around the country and learned what yes. happened in the country. I think when you go to the villages and you learn learn what people are doing, how people are living, and when they talk to you and they have, you know, there's so much of burden of expectation on the political leaders. I think politics per se, we are we are kind of very dismissive of politicians, but I think it's one of the toughest prof- professions ever. Yeah. You have to be all the time patient. You have to be all the time. sensitive to people's needs and i think it's quite a uh, uh, taxing profession yes, in yes. many ways so it's not an easy profession though we say okay he must be making money therefore the incentive i don't know about all that i mean those are things that uh, <coughs> you know would require more scrutiny and investigation but i'm saying it's a tough profession you needs connect people is connect and you realize that despite whatever the power and money that you may have people have the power to vote you out unless right. you have that connect unless you are able to give them hope unless you are able to give them a template that they think works for them works. so i think therefore uh, padyatra is not the only thing we plug in doing i mean yeah. they're using um, you know now we have campaign campaign strategies for coming yes, in yes. for planning it all for you even yes. they sometimes don't succeed yeah. but it's just perhaps in a way um, professionalizing what was done in a more arbitrary manner and now uh, so you know how to bound your campaign you know uh, it gets so uh, i think i re- i miss certain degree of rawness i mean if everything is going to be processed food then it's a little difficult we like something yes. to raw and something to natural but i think that personality also comes through despite whatever the packaging that you do yes. the original personality of the person does come through yeah so speaking about padyatra you sort of see it from a bird's view uh we have in vaisa doing the padyatra then we doing nara lokesh doing the padyatra what is the similarity maybe or more, what is the difference that you find or maybe the approach uh that these two parties are having while they are doing this padyatra i in fact asked uh, lokesh whether he had seen now uh, videos of uh, jagan mohan reddy's padyatra before setting off on it because that one was immensely successful as well yes so he said no he had not i asked him whether his father had advised him on uh, the padyatra or what he should do what he should not do he said no he did not in fact he did not even comment on it mm-hmm. but i think for uh, uh, both mr jagan mohan reddy and uh, mr lokesh they realize on their journey itself that what works for them and what doesn't work yes. and what works for the people what doesn't <clears throat> i thought it was i think it's a beautiful way for people to connect with their uh, voters and uh, they get a person to person feel that something uh, you were asking me how uh, how uh, effective okay. or important are padyatras for politicians i think that gives people that feel of what you're doing and um, connectivity a sense of connectivity a sense of connectivity yeah they relate to the person that person is coming to you it may or may not be the real person i mean how can you tell that is not possible but uh, when they they are, when they are putting forth what is there and they come to your village and they are talking to you listen listening to your problems i think that uh, makes a lot of difference to people how they perceive and what they because most of our audiences let's be they're not going to look at your uh, you know your uh, political theory and what your ideology of your party is and so on and the schemes these days i find people do know about the schemes yeah. people are actually uh waiting acha in logo ne ye kaha in logo ne ye kaha when it's telangana elections that just happened they said oh though they announced it first why was uh, brs waiting till now to announce uh, the yes. you know 400 rupee cylinder these people said fine it only then they did it yeah. otherwise they could have done it if you were really sincere and wanting to do it they would have done it before so i w- i realized that people do know and yes. people are talking about it and that's thanks to the social media and yes. all the other media which people are consuming all all the way i mean um we should say thanks to mr ambani or whoever else that you get free you know such cheap data that's yeah. such a big thing and we have digital infrastructure public uh, 
a digital infrastructure which has yes. made all this possible. Everyone has a cell phone and I think that's a very empowering machine because people are all the time listening to what is happening in the political sphere and making their judgment of what uh, is happening. And if we think that they're getting fooled by your, uh, you know, by your uh, whatever the pretense that you may do it, no, it's not that way because uh, I realized uh, in all these Padhyatras, one, you're talking about what you're going to be doing for the people. So Correct. people are judging you on that. Yeah. Second, uh, I think there are also interactions where if I tell you a problem, how you're going to resolve it, what you're telling me as the resolution of my problem, something I think people want to be heard because most yeah. of the time there's so much of frustration about not being heard in this country uh, because there's so much that could be wrong that someone comes and actually listens to you and says, okay, you have a problem and I think it's genuine and I'll try and resolve it. That itself is a big step. Maybe and I that's, think that's because what, they are breaking the hierarchy, they are breaking the barriers and reaching out to Otherwise, leaders. you cannot reach out to uh, leaders, isn't it? Yeah. If somebody is in the chief minister's chair, uh, it's very difficult for you to reach. And that's why I think, uh, you know, in the olden times, you talk about kings who go into the kingdoms uh, yes. and, uh, you know, disguise and so on and so yes. forth. Now, if uh, uh, one of the things that uh, Mr. KCR must have realized is that that connect with the people is lost. Otherwise, he is someone who had a great connect to the people. But... If you're going to be in an ivory tower and not being able to interact with people. One of his ministers had uh, argued with me saying to the, uh, uh, the role of a uh, chief minister is not really to be resolving your municipal problem and your water issue or your road or your leaking drainage or something like It's not. I mean, okay, he is supposed to do uh, bigger things like uh, think about envision the policy and development. I agree with him on that count that your time and thing is not yeah. going to... Those, there's it's a special system uh, through which you can resolve these. Yeah. Your local MLA or uh, mm -hmm. councillor, first of all, your yes, corporator yes. is supposed to resolve it, and it comes up the hierarchy. And when it's uh, difficult, then you, you know, you uh, then you come to the highest. But yeah. you cannot lose that connect unless people go and meet people. They will not know the pulse, and right. that's I think very important. Correct. Right. Having said that, um, we also have these upcoming elections in Andhra Pradesh. Are you anticipating anything? Uh, from these elections that is coming, upcoming elections in Andhra Pradesh? I think it's going to be one of the most exciting elections okay. for uh, three different reasons. One, that uh, it's one election which will be very different from any election north of the country because you don't have the main players as main players at all. Congress yeah. and BJP are out of the picture. You have uh, only two regional parties, which is uh, the YSRCP and the Teludesim, and it's almost it's a straight fight yeah. between them. And therefore, now. Uh, there is no third player to, in a sense, confuse the picture. Correct. So, we have always found that politics in Andhra Pradesh tends to be very sharp, very personal, very bitter. So, in that sense, it could be ugly sometimes. Yeah. It can tend to be ugly, but uh, it would no doubt be exciting. <laughs> As a political observer, I know that it will be exciting. and uh, Because they are also, uh, in a sense, should I say, quite equal parties. I mean, yeah. they, have, uh, they have the Carter base, they have... Uh, followers and uh, they represent certain um, ideology each of them unfortunately i think this is something that applies to all political parties all of them do go the way of welfare schemes something yes, that uh, yes. uh, i'm not against welfare schemes that uh, you know for instance when uh, tamil nadu started the midday meal scheme or yes. uh, you know uh, and andhra pradesh invested in schools and did all those yes. things amavadi which is a uh, scheme that is meant to give money to the mother sending her uh, child to school i think those are money that is money well spent yes. and telangana did uh, you know the sheep rearing or livelihood yes, uh, supporting yeah. schemes those are fantastic schemes and you i think those are money that is money well spent Wherever it is, leakages may be there. That's where I think the bureaucracy comes into view to plug those leakages. And politicians should be uh, aware to be able to ensure that the money gets spent the way it is meant to get spent. So a lot of that is good. But you can't rob a state of its uh, economic resources. Oh, so correct. that is happening universally. I mean, yes. uh, all political parties now, actually, they're also in a track. It's called, uh, you know, it's a trap that they are not able to get out of. And, uh, once somebody starts a scheme, it's very difficult for another one to come and kill it also. Yeah. Because then you become unpopular. So you have to only add to the same narrative and do one better. Yeah. So is it going to lead us to a situation like a Sri Lanka? Yeah. We are all looking at yeah. such a situation because 
resources are not endless and therefore you can't have this policy of uh, robbing the middle class and uh, or robbing the rich and feeling the poor they say yeah. but it's about being able to invest in an economy where people are able to be more productive see we all talk about demographic dividend as one of the you know india, india has a great demographic dividend we are yeah. in that phase where the productive population the technical definition of demographic dividend is someone who is above 15 years and uh, below 60 years that age is more than the people who are dependent which is 14 years and less and 60 65 and more so even if you take it as 20 to 60 we are in that phase where we have more number of people in the productive age the problem is that is the economy are we equipping the economy to be able to absorb this youth to be productive yeah, yeah. that's the biggest challenge second biggest challenge is that do you have the appropriate skills education that is equipping them to become productive individuals okay. if you have a huge youth population who you are going to uh, feed only doles and keep them uh, there yeah. then your productivity goes for a six one and you will have social upheavals because you don't have you have a population that has huge number of youth who are not uh, skilled uh, who are not skilled or not able to find jobs yeah. and that's the challenge that the government everywhere are finding now i mean uh, in telangana the biggest issue in the election was the unemployment oh, issue right. Right. similarly in andhra uh, even though the skill development cases are yes. uh, oh, uh, is famous for the uh, wrong reasons now because yes. of an alleged scam in it but uh, that we need skill development that we need to have centers that are able to equip you that is something that is known so what i'm saying is governments need to look at where your productivity is going to come from and uh, put your money where your mouth is this correct so speaking of the uh, state elections ma'am we have andhra pradesh having their um, state elections upcoming what is your anticipation or maybe you expect something from those elections okay andhra pradesh is going to be very exciting as assembly elections while uh, it will happen along with the parliament elections of course so there are 25 parliament seats and uh, uh, the assembly election why it is interesting is because uh, the lok sabha election whoever wins i would reckon that they are not they are going to be quite open to supporting the center so whether it is the telugu desam or the ysrcp that is not going to make too much of a difference nationally that figure uh, if the uh, if the bjp needs the support i'm sure either party is not going to be reluctant to give that support so what is going to be interesting in andhra pradesh to watch is uh, for naidu this is perhaps should i say uh, you know he can't afford to sit in the opposition one more term okay he is becoming more elderly yeah. and uh, he has to uh, strike the iron now and uh, and therefore he is going to put out all that he has all the might particular, all the might that he has in this particular election and coming together uh, with the pavan kalyan of the janasena is going to uh, you know it it worked for him in 2014 and he is hoping that it will work for him again in 2024 so andhra elections both the parties are obviously i mean any political party gives its all that it has but it's very interesting also for the fact that you know 2019 we said an organization like the ipac had helped jagan yes, mohan yes, reddy yes, come yes. to power and now what we have a scenario where uh, uh, there is an ipac that's working uh, with uh, jagan mohan reddy and then you have mr prashant kishor coming and meeting mr naidu and uh, so who is supporting who who is with who and what is happening this is very confusing for the public per se uh, but what is very clear is that they don't want leave anything to chance and therefore everyone is taking the advice that they get uh that they can get maximum and therefore i think they are putting their best foot forward in many ways if mr jagan mohan reddy has decided that it is the welfare agenda that's going to win him the votes and that's where he's investing i know uh, for a fact that he uh wants to ensure that the welfare agenda is works uh, for the works, works and he is able to uh, you know he ensures that the promises that have been made are uh, gets fulfilled that's what his his, his agenda is and uh, Mr Naidu with his political experience realized that there is a gap in uh, you know in the kind of perception that people have and uh, the perception if it is that you know there is no development and so on and so forth so he is yeah. going to tap into that emotion of the people and showing himself exactly what happened in 2014 in one sense when a new state was formed and you said experience is required now he is saying i am the one who got the jobs in hyderabad and i am the one who is going to get you the jobs now so the template is going to be different but what i found was that they also talk about babu guarantees uh, jagan already has his navaratnalu and they are only adding to that both of them are going to be adding to that how much each one can deliver because 
becomes a big challenge. Right. And that you spoke about the IPAC thing. I wanted to understand like TDP already had Robin Sharma. Now they're looping Prashant Kishore. So why is the need to, you know, now loop in Prashant Kishore? How do you see that? Robin Sharma is the one who is responsible for whatever the campaign strategy that's going on now. Uh, Showtime, whatever his firm is called. So uh, it's possible this is realm of speculation. Let's put it this way. Prashant Kishore has already said that he is not into election campaign strategy anymore. He is uh, now, he has his own uh, political outfit or he calls it non-political. He is doing his yatra and so on and so forth. So whether he is going to be advising them, who on whose advice did Mr. Prashant Kishore meet uh, Mr. Chandrababu Naidu? Those are also very important questions. Yes, Who yes. advised Mr. Prashant Kishore and Mr. Chandrababu Naidu to meet up? Is there somebody outside of this duel that you're talking about, YSRCP on one side, TDP on one side? Is there a third person who wants that Mr. Naidu should get advice from Mr. Prashant Kishore? I'm not going to tell you the answer to that because that's in the realm of speculation. But yes, there is something like that because I have in the past... Uh, seen uh, like we saw Mr. Sunil uh, here who was advising the Congress here. Yes, yes. So he was he had uh, he has told us in the past that he was told by someone to advise someone else. Okay. So uh, th it happens at the highest levels these things. So uh, while the organization that was founded by Mr. Prashant Kishore is advising Jagan Mohan Reddy, correct? It seems it's very strange that he yes. would be going to the other camp and advising, but. Uh, there could be also differences between the uh, uh, IPAC and Mr. Prashant oh. Kishore. That could also be Let's see part what of the happens. picture. We'll see. We, that's something that we are speculating. There's a lot of speculations going on. And the audience will obviously want to know what will actually happen. Uh, talking about the Andhra elections, how do you, like, what is your take on how much it is important for uh, Naidu? to sort of win this time? Do you think that it's like literally the need of the hour for him to win this this time and give all his might? And why so? He's very senior as a politician. He can't afford another term in the opposition. And uh, if he does that, he, uh, you know, in, uh, Mr. Nare, Nara Lokesh, only after this Padhyatra seems to be coming, uh, you know, becoming a politician on his own. Till now, you spoke about him as Mr. Naidu's son. Like uh, the Bharat Jodo Yatra, we said uh, Rahul Gandhi had a good image or rather was able to reinvent his image as uh, something, not the uh, not the unfortunate use of the word Papu uh, that was used for Mr. Rahul Gandhi. Similarly, uh, they call Mr. Lokesh as Andhra Papu, which I think is a very unfair uh, term. But this happens in uh, politics, I guess. There people are equally nasty and personal as well. And uh, therefore, it's only now that he's evolving and becoming a politician by on his own right. First time he's done a Padhyatra like this, which has covered some 3,132 kilometers. Yeah. So, um, his evolution still has not happened to that stature yet where he can demand votes on his own. But... Uh, for the first time, he is at least answering on his own. He's taking, uh, you know, he's taking a political stance and growing as a politician, maturing as a politician. Yeah. Speaking of uh, the upcoming elections in Andhra, I'm again back. Uh, there is speculation that Jagan might not give tickets to maybe like 40 of his MLAs. Do you think this is somehow after, it's a, like a... It's it's an after effect of the Telangana e elections. So I had written a piece for uh, the Telangana elections uh, saying that the fact that Mr. KCR did not change 90% of his uh, MLA candidates uh, last two successive elections, that was largely responsible for the defeat of the BRS. Uh, because if uh, they did very well in Hyderabad, because that's a strong uh, area, but uh, Beyond that, uh, in many of those areas, there is a lot of anti-incumbency against the MLAs and therefore uh, one of the theories is that that's one of the reasons why the BRS lost. Uh, obviously, there are lessons for Andhra Pradesh from Telangana and uh, uh, Jagan Mohan Reddy is not blind to it. And besides, he also knows that there is something like that that's brewing and that's why his own surveys would have told him about the feedback that he's getting and that's why he has been talking about it for quite some time now. But he's not going to be replacing them. From what I understand, he's going to be reshuffling them. Yeah. Uh, and uh, using them in a new constituency where uh, uh, where perhaps that animosity or 
the anger of the people may not be as much against the sitting MLA. So you reposition them elsewhere because even these uh, political leaders have to play it very delicately. One of the reasons why Mr. KCR would not have changed his MLAs is because in each of the constituencies, the MLA become it's an MLA-centric party. So everything revolves around an MLA. So if you remove that MLA and put someone else, he becomes your rebel. And if you have a very strong rebel in that area, it's very dangerous for the party because he has the resources, he has the links, he has the contacts, and he knows what to do in that area, how, how the election is won in that area. So having him as a friend was better. So it was a gamble that Mr. KCR took with his eyes open because he thought, having them as rebels would be more dangerous, would work. So now while, you know, we can all very wisely say that he should have changed his MLAs, but he may have uh, uh, thought that the rebel factor would be very big for him to not take that risk. And that's why he made the gamble. So similarly, I think uh, for Jagan Mohan Reddy as well, uh, always there is anti-incumbency and uh, uh, changing MLAs or changing the face uh, is seen as a safer option. Sure. Speaking of Telangana, Congress has portrayed KCR's uh, governance as, you know, um, family rule. S and it is being, there's a narrative that is being, you know, uh, circulated that it's a Prajala te Telangana versus uh, Dur Durala Telangana. So, um, why couldn't BRS basically overcome this narrative? Uh, what, was the, what was the shortcoming that you feel uh, was that made them not win this this time? See, basically, uh, the Prajala Dora Telangana versus Dorala Telangana was a narrative that the Congress started. Yeah. Of course, the BJP has been targeting the Congress also as a family-based party because they still have the Gandhis at the helm of affairs, even though they are not heading the party, really. But uh, in Telangana, with uh, uh, four members from the family being there, that was something that people noticed and they knew about it and they were talking about it. I don't think that is the singular reason why the defeat happened. It's not the Prajala Telangana versus Dorala Telangana which uh, led to the defeat of the BRS. Like I said, those factors about anti-incumbency against the uh, local MLA was uh, a very important uh, factor in the uh, defeat of the BRS, I think, because in... Uh, if you were to see the uh, vote percentage difference, it's not uh, too much of a difference that uh, you see in the vote percentages. If these people came down 10% and the Congress came up 10%, these people came down 10% and so on. So uh, the vote percentage difference has not been too much. What did happen was that that does add to the narrative and people thought, let's vote for change. Change is something that people like and uh, they think uh, we gave him a chance for 10 years. I, uh, uh, you know, in my political assessment, I didn't think there was a seething anger against KCR. There were people who were talking about his schemes and saying he did well. But certain schemes like, uh, you know, Dalit Bandhu or BC Bandhu or uh, the 2BHK, all of them, obviously, uh, they were not done to exhaustion and they could not have been done to exhaustion given hmm. the resources, financial resources. And therefore, that anger resentment that, you know, if all of us don't get it, it's okay. But if one person gets it, I'm going to feel angry that why That's going to spike that person. up. Yeah, so that anger will spike up. And then I think, let me, I'll use the power that is in my hands to be able to teach you a lesson. So that anger may be against the local candidate, but I think uh, uh, it is in that political calculation that they lost out. See, if you if you talk about uh, Mr. Harish Rao or Mr. K.T. Ramarao, both of them won in their constituencies. In their yes. individual constituencies, of course. And uh, I think a lot of the uh, victory that uh, uh, the BRS had in the city area is actually because of Mr. K.T. Ramarao, his extensive campaigning and I think his personal image, at least among the uh, youth in the uh, cities, is um, uh, tremendously positive. And therefore, they thought he represented something that they aspired for in terms of a growth of Hyderabad. And otherwise, the kind of candidates that they had in um, the city area was not something that I would think uh, deserved the kind of victory. But uh, uh, BRS, if it was seen as that pro-development uh, pro, uh, kind of a party or the KTR, the kind of an image that he um, portrayed, that did help uh, them. Congress, of course, did very poorly in terms of even putting up its candidates in Hyderabad. Even otherwise, it has not had a base. We have all spoken about even during municipal elections, how they hardly won a couple of uh, the wards out of the 150. But Congress didn't even have candidates that you, even if I wanted to vote for the Congress, I mean, you should give me candidates who are 
uh, who are uh, who seem like they can win the game so that they did not do in the city certain day okay so speaking of uh, change and speaking of winning uh, at any given point were you presuming that kvr could actually defeat stalwart kcr i mean like did you presume or predicted or even had given a thought about it you are talking about kamareddy yeah. where uh, venkatram reddy yes, has yes. defeated both the so called uh, chief minister candidates uh, when i traveled to uh, kamareddy uh, the g- buzz on the ground was that revanth reddy and kcr were both outsiders and uh, venkatram reddy uh, who's the bjp uh, mla now from there he had done a lot of social work in the area and a lot of the youth were uh, in favor of uh, mr uh, uh, venkatram reddy and uh, that's one reason why he won there i think straight away that is a straight reason why he won there uh, i remember asking just a day before the uh, end of campaigning uh, i asked uh, mr ktr this i mean i said it's looking like uh, he would win I, i and on the day of counting i asked uh, revanth reddy this he, he said why are you having any doubt that i'll win he said i said because that's what the ground um, my perception from the ground seemed to see that's what mr revanth reddy said and ktr said why uh, why have a doubt that uh, mr ksr will not win from there so these things happen to politicians of course they have to be confident of what they are doing and on their strategies but both of them had similar reactions but both of them lost the election so that's where i think uh, so people will make their choices depending on their local factors alone it's not just what you project state wide that people are looking at so those local factors also make a lot of difference to who you vote for and therefore uh, he is a man who has uh, defeated one Well, former CM and one yeah. to be CM, I guess. So, where's the crown? Correct. Now, uh, PRS and Congress are having this fight over the debt issues, and Congress has released its white uh, papers claiming that there is apparently a six point seven lakh crore de- debt um, from PRS uh, during their basically nine point five year rule. and on the contrary ktr has responded uh, with a powerpoint asserting that a debt of only 3.17 lakh crore um, is there and ha- it has he has further highlighted that there's a creation of 50 lakh crore wealth uh, what is your opinion on this arguments that is basically having from both the sides both are political parties so they both have uh, their opportunity to say whatever they want in the public domain whoever is in government um gets the opportunity to be uh, uh, to be vocal. the ones who are more heard more vocal as well and uh, therefore they uh, you know they have a better chance of getting heard in many senses but may- because uh, mr ktr has his own brand equity and brs has been a professional party and therefore their point of view also gets heard so the fact that uh, the debt was uh, you know we were uh, we were having much less debt and the debt has multiplied at least 10 times is undeniable but whenever i have spoken to leaders in the brs they have spoken about the fact that it's not today it's not about uh, you know all living your life only within your means it's about being able to borrow also to be able to grow because only when you borrow you're able to get the resources to be able to invest in stuff whether it is uh, infrastructure human resources even in welfare if you that can have other uh, you know multiplier effects in terms of uh, the human indices people's quality of life and so on and so forth so i'm saying both are not untrue okay what the congress is doing what the brs is saying both are not untrue both are both are true both are based on their own f- facts but like this is statistics is something that you can use to tell the story one way or exactly the opposite and that's what both are doing and i think it's a very healthy situation instead of having an unhealthy you know uh, situation where uh, my problem always is that in politics that we must have multiple parties we are in a multi party democracy and therefore whether it is states or it is the center we need multi party democracy and only then the democracy will be healthy so you are saying something somebody else is contending it now one of the reasons why people desire change is also this that they think that if one party is in power you will never know the real picture if the another party comes to power it's able to tell you that you went wrong here correct and you have to take corrective steps so next time you come back you are also going to be 
very vigilant that people are going to ask you those questions. I think so it's very healthy that parties change and political parties put each other up for questioning and accountability. And I think it's a very healthy situation that we are in. If people are accusing each other of doing whatever is wrong, whatever is, uh, whatever is proven is okay. If it is, if there is any malafide, that's different. And you, if I disagree with your model of growth that, you know, I would rather that you did not borrow on this or you did not invest in say the big, you know, Kaleshwaram project. I, I wish that you had invested instead in uh, small scale irrigation projects that may have benefited uh, the population and which may not have, uh, whose running cost may not be very high because this is a lift irrigation project and therefore the co running cost is very high and so on and so forth. So those kind of arguments are allowed. So I'm saying we should actually be happy that we are in a situation where there is a ruling party and there is an opposition party and it's best actually if both of them are equally strong. Correct. Having our elections, I mean like Congress has one fair and square in Telangana and uh, now that KCR has his own efforts and like he has all his, uh, he can actually streamline his efforts and power. So do you think in any time soon he is going to focus on national politics or he will just focus on the state politics? Now that national opportunity is kind of a little lost because when you lose an election in a state, it's not very easy for you to go national and start to try to conquer other states or trying to increase your political influence. If they had been able to win this election, sure, uh, Mr. KCR would have been uh, a, in a position to uh, uh, garner more support around the country. He has uh, shown that he has the financial resources, which is a very big thing. Uh, to be able to uh, spend for elections, to be able to campaign in different areas and so on and so forth. So you need a lot of muzzle power there, uh, money muzzle I'm talking about. So that opportunity is not very obvious now. Okay. And the second thing is Telangana as a state has only 17 MPs you're talking about. So how much of an influence can you possibly have? When you were a state of Andhra Pradesh, you had 42 MPs, you know, 25 plus 17. And therefore, your say in... Uh, uh, in um, in the politics of the country may have been a little more substantive. With 17 MPs, it's a little more difficult. The only reason Mr. KCR would have still had that opportunity is because if he had the leadership skills to be able to, and he had, you know, a line of leadership very clear here, you know, instead of, there's a succession plan which is very clear and people are already accepting whether it is his son or whether it is nephew, whatever. But uh, there is a trust in their leadership as well that the state had. So if he had been able to win this election, then that natural progression for uh, national politics would have happened. Uh, even otherwise, uh, they have, you know, they have n are not part of the a INDI alliance. They are not yeah. part of it. And uh, there are political reasons why they cannot be part of it as well. Congress is the uh, main opposition here and they can't be part of that alliance uh, for political reasons that it doesn't make sense for them politically to do that. So therefore, I think that window of opportunity right now is not a door. It remains only a window. I think that answers my question precisely. Talking about BJP in South India, it still seems to be a far-fetched idea, at least for BJP in South. Who do you think is a dependable and the most, you know, uh, the most strong candidate for BJP in South India? There can be a candidate for an entire region. Yeah, yeah. But like a strong figure that you could see. Uh, for no, there are a lot of leaders that have emerged who, have, uh, pro, uh, who uh, seem to have a lot of potential as well. I'm saying, um, if you saw Mr. Annamalai in Tamil Nadu, uh, for whatever the controversies that he may have been in the middle of, but he... Uh, was able to get that resonance, was able to get certain bit of momentum to the party and I think they are going to work on it. I mean, they are a very organized party. Of course, parties in power always look very powerful and they look like, oh my God, they must be having some uh, very brilliant strategy that we don't know about. Similarly, that's what was the presumption about what uh, their presence in Telangana as well, when at a time they started looking like they could be the main opposition yes. to the BRS here in the state and we thought, they are so smart, how can they make mistakes? But people do make mistakes. Um, there is this um, theory that, uh, you know, one is a Bandi Sanjay Anamalai kind of. I wrote a piece, in fact, on a comparing Bandi Sanjay's style and Anamalai style yeah. in Tamil Nadu and uh, you know, Telangana and saying, what is the difference and uh, will they make the mistake that they made in a Telangana 
in a Tamil Nadu with an Anamalai because in many senses, while they are they, well, they very different in uh, personalities, okay. one is an IPS officer, one person has come from the ranks and so on and so forth. But I felt that there were certain uh, similarities in the strategy. But there are others who feel that uh, the another brand of BJP politics which works in the South could have been a more stronger way. They call it the Dattatreya model. And they say that model would have been uh, a better template for uh, the BJP in the south of the country where perhaps uh, the same uh, northern templates don't work. Okay. Why North India rejected Congress and how BJP emerged victorious in Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh and Rajasthan? I'm like, why is uh, North India categorically rejecting <laughs> Congress on the face of it? Can you answer that? See, I think uh, as a party, BJP is much more organized and they have a more... Uh, a centralized leadership and thinking that goes into the, each of their strategies, whereas the Congress has lacked in that kind of uh, concerted, cohesive effort. And um, it's called a fire in the belly. I mean, uh, that the BJP always seems to have, whereas the Congress uh, uh, doesn't show that, doesn't okay. show that all the time. And therefore, uh, it's worrying for the party. So while all of us would like... Um, like I said, I like uh, multi-party democracies. Well, I may uh, why I may be happy with the BJP or I may be happy with, with Mr. Narendra Modi, but I think you need a good op opposition always. In a good parliamentary democracy, you need a good opposition so that everyone's voice is heard. I mean, the biggest strength we used to talk about the country was uh, our plurality in terms of media, in terms of uh, religions, in terms of diversity and so on. If you're going to lose the plurality, say, just in the media, Hmm. it has very dangerous consequences. Similarly, so for political parties, if you are a parliamentary democracy, you need multiple parties that are competing for that space. They should be critical of each other. They should point out. So that's the best situation for us. If two people are uh, fighting, I shouldn't say, but at least they'll expose each other. So if you have two strong people, it's best for the, uh, you know, it's like if I'm the uh, cat and I have two monkeys, I'm sorry, the political parties can't be called that. <laughs> I'll be democratic. I'll be saying something that's unparliamentary. But I'm saying you are in the best position if, uh, uh, you know, they are in that competing space where they can tell for you because they will act as the policeman and tell you and you have to only sit as the voter and say, I decide who how, who comes to power. You guys, you know, fight among yourselves and I'll, I'll, I'll decide who's the winner. But on, on that bit, what do you anticipate for co Congress in the upcoming general elections? Like, what do you anticipate? 2024, the horizon is very short. We have only five months to go. Correct. And uh, if you see analysis on different uh, channels as well, you'll understand, you know, the numbers in the south, the numbers in the belt that you spoke about where the BJP has already done well and they are likely to do better in the parliament elections. Even in Telangana, wherever you go, for instance, people uh, vote differently. We saw it in 2019 as well, isn't it? That how they voted for the BRS in uh, 2019 and how they voted in the parliament. I mean, saying in the assembly elections in 2018 and in the parliament elections in 2019 was very different, was vastly different. Uh, you had 88 seats that the uh, BRS got in 2018 just a few months before yeah. parliament elections. In 2019, the figure changed. You almost had, you know, 50% of the electorate voting for uh, other parties other than the uh, BRS. So the uh, even when you go and ask people this, I found uh, one answer quite strange. I mean, quite, uh, quite, you know, we are not living in a border part of the country. And yet, uh, you know, when I'm talking to some man on the street, a cobbler actually, I asked him this and he said, Ki, uh, national security ke liye karna padta, madam. Ye ke oh. nahi, uh, we don't uh, <laughs> you know we, uh, apne defense ke liye karna padta. Okay. The national election mein alag hota hai. so then he said I'll be voting for you know otherwise he was going to vote for whichever party here but for national election I'll be voting differently because oh, national, national security, security ke karna padta hai. Hai. So, uh, so, so this people are thinking differently at least so uh, they believe that image of Mr. Modi as the man who can protect the country who's who is able to uh, hold himself uh, well in front of a you know global audience? All that seems to work very well for the BJP. So um, I think the uh, time that the B uh, Congress needed to uh, rework its strategies for the India Alliance to get their act together, I think it's a very tough call for them to be able to get their act together in such a manner that they are able to 
challenge and defeat the bjp that's so it's going to be opinion. a tough fight i'm not a poll forecast person and i'm uh, no even poll forecasts are all <laughs> often wrong so that's dangerous territory to get into but what i'm saying is that for a campaign to be built it takes time for your structure to be built it takes time and which are the uh, states in which you are working what is what are you targeting in many of those states are you able to have a seat understanding with your uh, partners who are rivals how much is each one willing to step down see if i have an ambition of fighting uh, so many number of seats say uh, you know in in a state where uh, my own india alliance partner is my political rival will i be able to seed my space there yeah. say as a political party it doesn't make sense for me i have to fight as many seats as possible i cannot afford to give seats just because i want to win the national election that doesn't happen so that is going to be very tricky territory for all of them they have not still come to that stage right now we are all in tea party honeymoon stage yeah. where we are all meeting together and having chai and uh, you know yes, deciding yes. on some things but seat sharing is going to be very tough talk and i do understand that these five elections like you spoke about only telangana they had a uh, victory yeah, yeah. and even that it's not such a square victory i mean yeah. 63 seats is just about a few marks above the yes. uh, you know 3 4 above the mark that you have and yet the other seats other states i think will vote in possibly with bigger numbers for the bjp and therefore uh, their vote share uh, is expected to actually go up so whether it will convert into seats that's a different uh, thing uh, because already they are winning in those uh, states so it's a tough order for uh, the congress or for the india alliance so there are speculations uh, regarding modi uh, for the general elections that he is going to contest from malkajgiri or or maybe sikandrabad and while on the other hand sonia gandhi is speculated to contest from medak so why are they now focusing on south india i mean like what's the reason that may not happen at all so there are these uh, balloons that are let out usually to create that kind of a speculative mood and so on so it may not really happen at all sonia gandhi may not even contest the elections given her uh, health status and so on and so forth she's uh, i would think probably not going to be contest at all i mean that's for not for me to say but still we have seen in the past uh, prime ministers contest from here not just uh, 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 pv narsimha rao but we have seen uh, indira gandhi contest from here uh, so uh, that's not unknown we have seen sonia gandhi contest from karnataka we seen rahul gandhi contest from kerala so yeah. uh, that's a way of also showing for the leader to say that i'm not just a north indian okay. uh, politician i mean if uh, mr modi has huge following in the south of the country yes, as well yes. so uh, one way for uh, for instance when mr anti ramarao contested from multiple regions in the state itself it is also his way of showing that i i represent people from different parts of the state i am not just from one part of the state so not confining a, themselves from one particular area yeah so you don't have to be confined to an area and he is someone who would be it's an acceptable face for the entire country and you say that south is important for me and therefore i do it so that i think um, creates an emotional resonance i think it's a good thing if it happens okay i think this question you might like because um as the renowned poet said shri shri uh, once said stated that newspapers are poison born out of capital and fiction there is a criticism that many media houses serves as a mouthpiece for specific political parties what are your thoughts on it so media ownership is a very uh, passionate subject for me yes. um I think India has had a very uh, good history of uh, professional media and uh, which has uh, worked in a professional manner and to be able to deliver what it is meant to do of course India's uh, media had its origins in the freedom movement and therefore we started off itself as a biased uh, biased house because we were not meant to be balanced at that time our single point agenda was freedom for the country yeah. and the you know uh, voice of our own people being heard and so on so everything has an agenda and it has a subjective part of it the point is are you able to be professional about it and not be misused by vested interests so there have been professional media houses whether it's a bennett coleman company they are uh, professional media house hindu 
professional media house, NDTV, professional media house, even a Deccan Chronicle, Deccan Herald, all of them, Statesman, Telegraph, all of them have been wonderful. And there are any in the, uh, any numbers of them in the uh, local media as well. I mean, I'm saying Malayalam Manorama. All of them are um, fantastic. Uh, in every state, you will find it and it's good. What's happened now is that um, three things. One is where political parties are themselves starting newspapers. Not just newspapers. They have uh, channels the, that they are sponsoring. Up front, if you're sponsoring, there is no problem with that. The problem comes when you are hidden money and you have an interest and you are not able to see uh, that interest. It's not visible to the people about who is having the funding and therefore what is the flow of the story. My worry now is that even in that, if you have plurality, there is no problem. In the country, we don't have a law saying that uh, a political party should not own a newspaper or a media house. Anyone can own a media house. So if I decide to today, uh, if I had the money and I decide that I'll stand a media house in which I will only say that Uma Sudhir is the, uh, you know, sexiest thing, most smart thing, most uh, bright thing. I'm allowed to do that. If I have the money, I'm allowed to do have my license and I'm allowed to say that. I'm Patronizing saying. So, oneself. <laughs> yes, you can do that. So if you have the money and resources and the indulgence, you can do that. So political parties, anyone can own a media house. So corporates can own it. Uh, political parties can own it. And we have uh, a numerable number of examples. Yes. In the south of the country itself, we have Sun TV, which is owned by the... Uh, DMK group, uh, Jaya TV was owned by the Jaya group, uh, AIA DMK. Then you have here ETV, which is not owned by any group, so to speak, but it was said to be, you know, in the camp of uh, the uh, TDP party yeah. because of caste reasons or other reasons. And you have Jagan Mohan Reddish, you know, Sakshi TV and so on. So you now you have Telangana, T News, everything. The problem now is that my worry is that there is no neutral space that seems to be left. And even there, again, I think plurality was our biggest strength. And that's what we are losing because we're becoming a monopoly. And everywhere, uh, singular political parties in power are trying to control all the media, controlling their revenue and resources, and therefore their content as well. And that, I think, is a big worry. Okay. As a journalist, ma'am, uh, whose, whose work do you look up to? I mean, like, that could be your mentor or maybe some fellow colleague Whose work do you admire the most? Actually, uh, you admire many different kind of journalists for the different kinds of works that have that uh, that they have done. Precisely. Unfortunately, what happened was when I, uh, you know, I was working in the Times of India. Uh, I used to work in Delhi, the Times of India. Then I came as state correspondent for the Times of India here. Then when the Economic Times was launched, I became um, part of this. You know, I mean, became a business journalist with them. Uh, subsequently, when the 24-7 channel was launched of the NDTV, I joined them. I think because I was in a bureau, I actually did not have a straight mentor. Okay. Somebody who's there uh, right away where you are and to be able to. So then your process of growth is much faster because then you see people operating in a newsroom and so on. So uh, being in a bureau in that sense was limiting. My boss will never agree. I mean, Pranoy and Radhika, no, 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 nothing like that. You've, you've done what you needed to do and so on and so forth. They would put it like that. But I'm saying... I think in terms of inspiration, the biggest inspiration has been my boss, Pranoy Radhika. Not just because of the kind of journalism that they did. They never interfered with any content that we put out. And for the kind of human beings that they were in that journalistic space, understanding very well what is journalism, sensitivity to journalism, empathy. And I think the kind of stories that I have been able to do or the kind of journalism that I think politics is something we all as journalists do. But... Uh, the other kind of journalism that I've been able to do, I think a platform like NDTV was responsible for allowing me to do that kind of journalism. If drought became national headlines, uh, you know, 25 years ago, we never used to cover drought earlier. Ours were, you know, NDTV was a channel which covered farmer suicides, droughts, children, trafficking, human rights, uh, gender rights, violation, social NDTV is known for it. Yeah, so that platform as an uh, important storytelling uh, platform uh, and making something that we, you know, a story of a tribal woman in Nalgunda, Devarakunda, becoming a national headline and the relevance of it, I think that platform was offered by uh, 
NDTV and hands it, down. Yeah, and uh, I think the credit goes to the leadership. If today Ravish Kumar is uh, celebrated by one um, category of people, let's say one uh, huge category of people, who provided him the platform for it? Uh, Pranoy and Radhika, despite the fact that they had the heat on them at many times, they were able to provide. They uh, they allowed him to do what he did, and I think that's what is uh, marks them out as individuals that. they allowed you to practice the journalism that you believed in and even in indi tv we would have you know every morning we have these uh, con calls and then we would argue should i say we could even fight about yeah. it but ultimately uh, it was logic that won and your arguments that won and if you were right they never asked you to do the wrong things they didn't say that you know if someone is dead in someone's house and you go and thrust the mic in their face all those things were no no so the ethics that were taught there yeah. the kind of values that were there i think uh, that's one reason why you will find many people who are in uh, ndtv would continue to be in ndtv yes. and that kind of a uh, culture was there yes. in ndtv and uh, i think uh, that's why i feel angry when um, uh, people there are uh, you know uh, just like in any other profession whether it's the bureaucracy whether it is doctors whether it is lawyers uh, there would be that category of people who work professionally who take a lot of pride in their work and uh, uh, you know give it the respect that it deserves and treat it with the respect that it deserves so and i think uh, that's why i get very angry when people make any kind of allegation on yeah. social media and get away with it my policy is very simple with journalism it's like you know take yourself seriously don't take yourself seriously at all both at, at the same time because you are a journalist you may be belonging to a big organization people will talk to you nicely people may uh, treat you nicely wherever you go uh, but that doesn't have anything to do with you personally it, nothing personal about it so therefore uh, take it as something that's a courtesy that is being extended to you for your media house but people also can um, Uh, you know ridicule your work and think that it is you know ye log to sirf chai ya daru pila do i don't drink at all so that's another thing but whatever yeah. something or you know gift de do to somebody will be very pleased about it yeah. so that's where your own ethics come whether it's the smallest of stories or biggest stories i do it with the same integrity i do it with the same thing and i can stand up there and say today that i do every story to the best of my ability to my honesty and i think that's this kind of people exist in every every sphere and i think that's why india still works despite the fact that everything else and there's no nothing harm so that i take very seriously my work if i uh, my work even if it's a small story on um, on say a weather or uh, you know some crime story it may yeah, be yeah. i'll do it to the best of my ability and that's my professional space and i will ask you and i i don't think it's a small question for you to answer yes. i'm saying as a if you are if you are the chief minister and i'm asking you this question Uh, about something, something that happened. Why, why isn't an Aadhar card given to this person, or something like that? So that's a question that I will take seriously and uh, expect you to uh, take me seriously when I'm asking that question. So I take myself very seriously as a journalist. Everything else, cool. <laughs> Can take a back seat. <laughs> yes. Okay. I think that actually reflects in your work also the kind of stuff we see. Um, that pretty much reflects in your work. What is that one particular in? incident or i would say a situation that you came across that was very intense while were you were maybe interviewing or you were in your professional space some said some incident of that sort many times you know um, as journalists we live vicarious lives in many senses so when there is celebration you go to a uh, sana nehwal's house or sanya yes. mirza's house or uh, or something else some achievement that is big and you uh, celebrate along with them and you're very happy with them that also happens and when something uh, terrible has happened with somebody some tragedies have uh, happened you go with them and without knowing you will also cry along with them you are not meant to do that i know as objective journalists i mean sometimes people tell me how do you go to so much of disaster and still come back home and do what we keep doing but i guess after a certain time you kind of develop a wall maybe but i do tend to get more involved uh, with whatever happens and i think that's each each one's personality to their own but i think there are multiple situations where this happens i have reported on any number of deaths due to suicide i have farmers uh, suicides is something that i have covered as a series over several years uh, 
and every time you go there you see the pain in a family when young children are there and they are actually very confused why did this dad do this to me yeah. and i remember asking a child also do you feel angry that your father did this and they don't they can't even express that thing about you know why the anger is there and the, why did my dad do this and he knows that we are worse off without him yeah. you know obviously the family is going to go through much worse conditions when the father is no longer there and till yesterday he wanted to ensure the best for his child and that's why he was doing whatever he was doing and protecting them from whatever so you feel the pain of what happens with them similarly even when a child dies by suicide for instance mm. oh i've had very close encounters with parents who have had to go through something like that and they start blaming themselves for what goes wrong and yeah. you know when a child fails or i mean those are so minor in terms of you know the larger scheme of things and then the child has done something so extreme so i feel very strongly about these issues that we don't don't address i have done documentaries half hour shows on deaths like this um i rem- you remember the hyderabad uh, rape that happened of yes. a young woman here and uh, uh, i was one of the few families of i was one of the few people journalists who the family actually met with and i interviewed them uh these are very sensitive times you know they've lost a child uh, and in the most brutal manner sometimes there are uh, tragedies that you know, that you know you can't even explain what kind of pain that people are going through and each time you go through those things along with them yes. and come back and i think i may even get angry with people come at such a time and you know in my private time and yes. <coughs> private time of grief we try to avoid such situations i i dislike going to such places because they're very um, they're very intrusive and yet you sometimes have to tell that story because there are larger uh, there's a larger picture to it there's a larger picture to it and you're hoping that somebody else has, doesn't have to go through the same yes, yes. kind of a pain and it serves as a lesson yes. i have met uh, a child uh, who jumped off from the fifth floor because he wanted to commit suicide both his legs were broken uh, he survived the accident uh, 12th class again pressure of exams and so on and so forth so there are a variety of such things one of the most heartbreaking uh stories that i've done is from the northeast where youngsters it was actually a room like this a room full of youngsters who were all uh, into drugs and they were actually trying to come out of that drug and they were given alternate medicines which would help them slowly uh, be weaned off the drugs but to see youngsters in that state of being drugged yeah oh it is terrible and then i met a mother in that same place who actually had to continue taking the drug she was pregnant she had a baby and there is a small toddler in hand but because she had been using drugs when uh, the baby was in her womb the baby got used to the drug and therefore in order to ensure that the baby does not have withdrawal symptoms she had to take the drug and uh, through the breast milk the child would get the drug oh. because the withdrawal symptom was so severe for the children so these are and uh, there are double things there you know there is uh, um, a double tragedy i should say they become intravenous drug users then there'll be female uh, you know they became female sex workers because you have to pay off one of the other so these are all i've gone to such houses i've i've had meals with them i've stayed with them um, hiv uh, patients who are uh, you know at that time they couldn't see hope i think things have changed a little with the yes. kind of drug regimen that they get and also on and so forth but what i find most tragic is you know already we have enough things that happen tragic which are not within our control but those things which are within our control and yet they happen and i think that becomes a very huge tragedy for me and one of the best things about the journalism that uh, i have been able to do or rather the platforms have provided and with people supporting was that wherever youngsters were able to get opportunity many of these families i think for the youngsters to be able to get that opportunity of hope and to continue studies and then they become something those were otherwise fra- journalism can be very frustrating at one level because you say i reported on this you know tragedy so many years ago and yet it's continues to happen in exactly the same way you still have the same things but you still look at those little things that have changed little uh, uh, beacons of hope that come and then you say okay my work was ultimately you know all of us are looking for work that is meaningful and something that makes you feel that okay what i did 
you know, it was not totally meaningless. It was something that made a difference to at least some lives. I may not have changed the world, but something changed in somebody's world. Yeah. Therefore, it is worth it. That's you end up thinking. But I think there's a lot of pain in this world. And therefore, for me, that kindness is a very important word to be able to be empathetic and to be able to be kind and not be so selfish because nobody takes anything away f- ultimately when you're going. Correct. Having said that, ma'am, do you have any piece of advice for the young journalist or maybe I could say budding journalist? What is that one piece of advice that you can tell them blatantly? <laughs> okay. Most um, uh, journalists would probably say bad place to in, be in. <laughs> you're, you're, you're really, you're really uh, uh, you don't know what you're bargaining for. That's what you may end up uh, saying. But I think it's a profession that gives you uh, a lot of exposure into a lot of realities, uh, a lot of experiences which add a lot of value, uh, richness to your life. The texture of your life really changes, I think, because you see um, so many different kinds of people and uh, so many different kinds of life situations and experiences from a uh, from an earthquake to a hudhud uh, to a you know to a national disasters you would see, and even in those places where people show character. Uh, you know, I I can't uh, stop saying these kind of stories. I mean, I remember in Hudhud uh, on the beach when you're not having any food and so on and so forth, and people were selling at exorbitant rates. And one one lady there, she must have been forty or something like that. She was selling at exactly the same rate she would be selling makabotas, you know, the corn uh, things. And I said, why are not, why you're not you know you could easily spike up the rates and people would buy. She said, no, my work ethic does not allow that. What I oh, started off with, I will continue to uh, sell with. So you find those people with character. It doesn't have to do with the money. Yeah. It doesn't have to do with their life situation, but they show a lot of character. I'll tell you another story which I thought was very um, something very uh, heartening. Uh, uh, we had uh, I've been tracking child trafficking and so on for several years now and uh, one of the more recent ones uh, was about we had uh, a baby that got sold you know it all changed a lot from the time of this of 20 year old story so once I start yes. telling it I, you know there was this uh, thing about uh, international child trafficking there were uh, children in um, uh, so called homes here who were getting sold to okay. people abroad in the name of ab- adoption. So they were being actually kidnapped from tribal belts where you have these Lambada children who are fair and they are, have good physical structure and so on and so forth. Of course, it was, it had its root in uh, the female feticide or infanticide. Instead of killing them, they were kind of giving them away. So the parent felt better. It's another matter that, you know, traditionally the Lambada tribes never had dowry. That is something that they learned from so-called main culture you know okay. the mainstream culture that otherwise they had actually the bride price you have to pay a price to the bride but now uh, they had learned that and that became a burden and then they started selling the girls uh, I had done that and uh, things changed at that time you know uh, there was an abdication policy that came in the uh, uh, you know Salem and Tamil Nadu had this cradle thing about okay. uh, you know if you don't want a baby you can leave the baby in a cradle uh, by a hospital and the government would bring up the baby so you don't have to kill the baby. So that belt where uh, Madurai, Antipati, that area used to be infamous for uh, female feticide and that's when that scheme was started and that's something that when Renuka Chaudhary was the uh, Union Health Minister, she had brought that in here and then uh, in these tribal belts you had these uh, cradles that were kept and people could abandon the baby if they didn't want to bring up the baby. So they were all trying for male uh, children of course, babies of course. But unfortunately what happened was that Policy changed with, hopefully, with our stories, the support for the mother increased, all that happened. But what had also happened was they, one mother I met, in, in one particular primary health center, in just in one month, there were some 24 babies who had been abandoned. It's a small, uh, you know, few villages that it caters to. And they were all female babies that were being given up. One mother had tried seven pregnancies. Because I track people through years, so I know them. Seven pregnancies she had done and she was giving away her eighth baby when I met her. Oh, and uh, she said, Ab to legal hai na, madam. De de na to legal hai na. That's what the mother-in-law told me. So similarly, after that phase when they said we will support the mother and so on, very uh, few years ago, again we tried tracking that same thing. And this time, at that time what happened was private adoption agencies were all closed. They said you can only do it through the government agencies. Okay. 
and then I went to Nalgunda again, this time to a government agency. When I went to the government agency, the guy who took me, koi bhi baby le lije, madam, koi problem nahi hai. I went in decoy as a couple. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, koi bhi le lije. So then he said, ab kal aate to bhoat achcha tha, 3 kilo ka gya, madam. 3 kilo is not sabzi or something that you're talking about. He's talking about a 3 kilo baby, baby. that went. And uh, I was quite shocked by what he said. So then uh, I said, ab to pura agya hai na, aapko register mein likhna padega ki bachche, you know, itte bachche aay, itte bachche aay, aap kaise keh rahe hai ki le jau, kisi bhi bachche ko le jau. So he said, oh, book adjustment ho jata, madam. To oh. ye agar ankita aap leke gaye, to ek aur baby aay ki usko ankita kar denge, uska naam ankita oh. kar denge. So the book adjustment, if there are 42 babies, there will continue to be 42, 42 babies. babies. So there won't be any problem. That's when the iris thing came afterwards Sad. for the babies also so it can be commodifying babies yep. and then it so happened we did a sting in fact in the city itself where uh, people came to offer us babies and baby was still in the womb and they had done uh, uh, the, the scanning and then the baby delivery is expected in June so aapko kab chahiye madam delivery kab chahiye so they'll accordingly the mother is uh, prepared and then you get the baby delivery the month that you want and you got the baby, okay? Whatever the baby. So, one such baby we negotiated, we got and all that. In fact, uh, when we went to Nalgunda, we almost got caught because the gentleman who was with me was very over enthusiastic and he kind of said, he am ko baby de rahe hum unko, you know, usually you bargain, no? if you say 30,000 rupees, you say, nahi, nahi, 20,000 rupees, yes. 10,000 me de do, kuch to bargain karenge, no? he bole, nahi, nahi, hum aapko na, gold ring bhi bana ke denge, aap to humko baby de rahe na, gold. so that woman thought this is very suspicious, so instead of, <laughs> instead of, then she said, show me your thing, show me your bags and so on. She actually took away all our bags and we had, I had a camera inside. Camera meaning it's hidden camera okay. inside the bag. But then she realized something was wrong because all the numbers were, you know, uh, commissioner, this, that numbers were there. And she realized something was wrong and she put us, she kept us inside a room actually. And she was actually, she's someone who's uh, even now out, but she's used to be also a serpent. She has murder cases against her and all oh that and trafficking cases also. She went to jail subsequently after my reports. But what I'm saying is very filmy manner. She kept us inside and somebody would come and she would beat them up. That's all psychological uh, game, no? That you will get more scared that, you know, yeah. somebody she's beating up and so on. So, I'm telling you some story from where we started. But the long and short of it is that when I, when we rescued another baby here, yeah. they came and gave it. So, we had all, uh, you know, uh, in decoy, the policemen standing there. And then they come and deliver the baby and then we gave the money. All that we had to create uh, evidence. Yeah. Only then it becomes... Uh, thing in a court of law so the baby was there so the baby was a very young baby hardly about 10 12 days old okay. and it was summer and i was really worried because the baby had not breastfed and they had come for a long time so it's very uh, uh, strange because i was going as the uh, lady mother who was to receive this baby and then they changed the location and all that so the yes. police said you know you have to uh, keep your thing on location on so that we'll follow you wherever you okay. go because you had informed the police uh, before and this decoy teams were waiting we were at a temple and they were coming and then they had to okay. count the money and so on but i'm saying after this baby came to my hand um, baby was obviously very delicate and very small hardly a few couple of weeks old and when we went to the police station, uh, there was a woman there who had come who was a case of domestic abuse and she'd come with her child and there was another child that she was breastfeeding and I was wondering what to do with this child and that lady said, I'll breastfeed the baby, don't worry about it, I'll breastfeed it. And we are sitting, in fact, imagine inside a police station where the, you know, mafia, the guys who have been caught are there and the baby is there. And this lady, we go into the inspector's room and then she breastfed the baby. She herself is coming from a situation of great distress. But she said, ye baby ho to, mera baby ho to, kya farak padta hai? I will uh, breastfeed. People are very emotional about things like that. They don't, not very many people are, you know, uh, open to the idea of breastfeeding another baby who yes. don't you they didn't but she breastfed that baby and then whatever happened so i thought she was coming from a situation of violence difficulty yes. her older child was there that child is also part of my story in that story where i've said all this will be available online but she breastfed that baby and helped on that day i'm saying so you find these glimmers of hope everywhere that you uh, see and then um, it's kind of very heartening and heartrending. Whether you know, I have this very another favorite story. I'm sorry no, no, about uh, you know terror uh, when the blasts happened here. 
I had covered the twin blasts happened yeah. here, and yes. the, uh, they called it Islamic terror. It so happened that hundreds of youth were not uh, not guilty in that case. Also, were taken in by custody by the police and so on. And I subsequently did documentaries on them. All of them subsequently were acquitted, though they were initially. Uh, labeled as terrorists when the twin blasts happened makkah bl masjid blast yes, happened yes. and the lumbini park and um, gokul chart blast happened uh, at that time i was in fact very wary because people would say oh aap log to you know terrorist ko platform de rahe ho you oh. know when you are uh, allowing them to have their stories and so on so in that uh, series of course i've Um, afterwards they've got acquitted and all that before they have gone to their weddings walima whatever else and all that so you become they become part of your life story as well uh one guy uh, was arrested uh, saying that he was he had he was supposed to be from uh, maharashtra and he had come to hyderabad and in a place in boinpalli he was supposed to have kept 100 kg of rdx okay at that time he was arrested for that terror thing and all that he was also subsequently acquitted but he was coming to court so one day uh, i'm standing actually jagan mohan reddy was appearing in the nampali court and i was standing there to report he used to come there uh, physically for his cases no? and then i'm standing at the court and doing this madam madam he said i said pehchane nahi madam i said sorry jaad nahi ara 100 kg rdx madam <laughs> <laughs> so that's how he is telling me that uh, that's the case 100 kg rdx madam then i said yeah 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 so rabuddin was his name so but uh, i'm saying you have a uh, strange encounters yes. with people and uh, they are uh, something that you uh, realize it's a tapestry of kind of experiences which enriches your life and therefore uh, i think you started off asking what is uh, in terms of journalism what do you have to offer so this kind of experiences probably are uh, something quite quite unique Enriching. and therefore go for it sure one last question ma'am so you have your young uh, daughter tejaswini does she aspire to uh, literally step into shoes of such uh, you know good mentors the parents that she has or does she have some different ideas uh, as far as the career concerned she is uh, pursuing engineering so okay. she is doing uh, ai and iot uh, emerging technologies because i do think uh, the technology is required for whatever uh that you do and uh, we came from a generation which um actually didn't even have the internet when yes. we started off so the first computers came when i was in the times of india we used to still be making oh. physical pages at that time and we were not using the computer so we did not grow up with the computer uh, you know only during my i think journalism training period did i perhaps first time uh, see and work on a computer i'm saying and there was were stand alone machines okay. you know that like that kind of a thing so we are coming from that generation and therefore uh I think technology is a game changer in every way and uh, being very conscious of it I think she chose that to okay. think that and I think she seems to enjoy what she does so while she enjoys uh, uh, journalism I think I think she likes to know about things she is uh, loves to watch the news and so on and so forth actually we don't play much news on our uh, at home at all okay. we hardly watch TV <laughs> that's another matter but I'm saying that fascination is there and I think that's something that every youngster needs to have so that we are more conscious of what's happening around us and build in a sense that uh, better world i think that uh, i told you about the hudhud experience similarly you know uh, you can be in certain situations which are very dangerous as well i remember when she was much younger i had gone off to cover some cyclone and uh, uh, cyclones are not uh, easy to yeah. cover either and uh, sometimes you can be in dangerous places and when i didn't call her for uh, you know that's the only time she says that she fits and the other time was when i went to this thing and they kept us captive i told you know so she got very panicky that what happened to mom and why she's bound not, to be yeah uh, calling back otherwise she knows generally yeah. that uh, we would do something and so on so this this time the latest in odisha i mean 2000 first time super cyclone came i was there i was i had covered it and later 20 years later i was again in odisha when the super cyclone came and this time that time there were no cell phones at all remember correct, correct, there were no correct. cell phones even the landline phones were all gone the only phone that we reported from was a satellite phone a single satellite yes. phone that was in the chief minister's residence giridhar gomang was the chief minister at that time and i remember nobody had gone to paradeep we were the first to go even before the administration when the 10000 people died in that uh, cyclone oh. and when we went there 
full of bodies everywhere. Um, you know, there's a even a visual a promo in NDTV where I'm talking and behind me there's this earth uh, mover which has and there'll be many bodies there. You know, oh. like that uh, moving. So that is the numbers that we saw at that time. But what I'm coming to say is the most recent one. While we talk with great pride about what we have, you know, we have gone here, gone there. I'm Encountered. saying it's not. It's not fun if something goes wrong, uh, you know. So uh, we were in this thing going towards Puri, which was the eye of the storm very recently, a uh, couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, you have to stand also holding the door or holding something because you will get blown away by the wind. The wind speeds are so high. And once when I was standing, opened the car door and the wind was so much that the car door broke, broke. And when the car door breaks on one side, you have to open the door on the other side because otherwise you'll get blown away. Yes, yes. You'll just be get blown away. These days we see so many viral videos of the cars getting washed away. Then we realize that, oh my God, everywhere trees are falling and this is foolish. So we tried to come back. Of course, we are not able to come back because there are so many trees that had fallen um, on the way. But I'm saying these kind of uh, adventures, I don't like to call them. They are real life situations that people are facing that we go get the opportunity everyone will be moving this way with the terrorist stuck here we are going in the opposite direction and <laughs> going towards where trouble is whether it's a riot whether it's a cyclone whether it's any other kind of disaster so that is a unique opportunity that you have to use responsibly i i think uh, whether uh, in earlier days there used to be this naxalite encounters that would happen or even when we travel to chatisgarh sometime when huge numbers of people were killed in encounters and sometimes we have reached where even before the police did and the reason they don't go there is also because there'll be booby traps if you go to a place they actually leave a dead body there and if you go and explore it can blow up in your face because they'll keep these earth mines the uh, yeah. uh, bombs that are there so uh, those are situations where you know there were bullets still lying on the ground when we reached there been there so those are experiences so you have to be responsible but if you don't have that passion if you don't have that uh, excitement for uh, something like that then you can't survive it yeah, so you can't keep going yeah you can't keep going if you want to do safe then this is not the field but if you want that experience that excitement it's unfair unfair to reduce it to a uh, you know experience as in an enjoyable experience but it's an experience <laughs> I think that's that's for it. I mean, like nothing much more. It was uh, definitely a very uh, enriching experience for us, and also for the I'm sure for the viewers it will be. Uh, thanks a lot, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, for watching, and I hope you the biggest takeaway from this hopefully is that whatever you're doing, do it passionately. Do it in such a manner that you will enjoy yourself because every job will offer you that excitement. It's just for you to ensure that you see the joy in it. Thank you. I think that's all. That's that's good for us. <laughs> <laughs> Ma'am, we will request you to say to our viewers about uh, like, share and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> that will be give a boost to <laughs> reaching the masses. <laughs> So this is your opportunity to know what's happening firsthand from all these names and faces that South One is getting for you and therefore like you to like, share and subscribe to South One.